Okay, so um, last class we ended with, uh, while talking about the theory of karma. Um, so I'm going to continue talking about that. I'm going to quickly summarize. We spent only about 10 minutes on this last class. I'm going to quickly summarize what we did then, all right? So this is what I was calling the bare bones conception of karma. It's kind of like any theory of karma has got to at least include these things. Right? You have to have this causal order, distinction between right and wrong action, and good stuff comes to people who perform good actions, bad stuff comes to people who perform bad actions. Sometimes these consequences arise far removed in time, much later in a single life, in another life, whatever it is. So you need these intermediaries that we'll just call merit and demerit that, that uh, connect the two. Okay. So you perform the right action, it produces merit, and then the merit kind of sits there and waits to come to fruition. And the, the analogy with uh, a flower blooming or fruit, fruit um, growing from a tree is very common in this context in, in the Hindu traditions and other traditions that accept karma. Uh, merit and demerit are the words I'm using for the concepts that we have in the West of good and bad karma. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about good and bad karma when I can avoid it. Instead, I'm going to talk about merit and demerit. But it means the same thing. You say, well, I've got some good karma. I'm just waiting around for it to come to fruition. What I'm, I'm just going to say, you have, you have a bunch of merit that you're waiting to come to fruition. Okay, this is the bare bones view. Um, and then lastly, I just want to say um, there is this idea in a lot of texts that a particular god, Varna, is responsible for distributing the consequences. And that's fine. And I think you can make perfectly good sense of how this works that way. The, the only issue is that many texts, many ancient seminal Hindu texts, do not think that Varna does the job. And they instead think of this as a psychological mechanism that is operating somehow independently of cooperation from outer forces. Okay. Um, that's about where I got to last time. So we're not worried so much about the Varna view of it. We're more concerned with this kind of psychological conception of how karma operates and whether it's, whether it's a consistent theory. And then also whether it's true. And I think you can evaluate the theory of karma independent of the theory of rebirth. Milosh. Would this theory of karma not require God? It's not supposed to require God. Uh, bec well, the, there's, there, uh, there's, the, there's a text called the Yoga Sutra that asserts these causal relations and explains karma in this way that does not think that God has a role in, in carrying that out. So some texts, some traditions are going to need to explain this without referring to God. So th this by itself might totally upturn your conception of what karma is, because you might have always thought of it as God and his, his ledger of positive and negative things you've done, right, or something like that. But it's supposed to be able to operate in, independently of that. Is that all right? Yes, okay, good, good. Good, so you're saying, what about these cases where you're helping somebody out repeatedly and then eventually they're able to help you out, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, isn't that karma? Um, well, there's this tendency in especially Western academic literature on this topic that tries to make the theory of karma sound as commonsensical as possible. Um, so, so that if I ask you, do you believe in the theory? The, the idea is if I, well, remember the, the way I elaborate this, I'll put, this, I'll put that back on the board again in a minute, but the idea is when you elaborate this in a certain way, it starts to sound totally commonsensical. Just like this you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours view is, do you, do you believe that when you help people, chances are more than likely that they'll help you later when they get an opportunity or not? Do you believe that when, when you're a really moral person that people tend to be honest with you and, and, and loyal to you or that people will, will betray you all the time? You know, I, mean, I think there's a certain common sense idea that when we're good, good things happen to us and when we're not, 
bad things happen to us. And so even when the good person, the bad person seems to get away with something, we say, oh, they're going to get theirs, you know. So there, that's a competing tendency. I think that's a very Western idea um, that we have to somehow make the theory of karma commonsensical. Um, and so the view, the interpretation that I'm going to give you, I mentioned this name last time, but I'll just write it on the board because I want to be clear that I, I thought about just, just assigning the, um, assigning the, Carl Potter, assigning the article that I was using to put this paper together, but I thought it was easier to read what I had written. This is his view, and then his view is, it just, it's just like a virus, just, it just spreads, and everybody that writes on yoga thinks that Potter's interpretation of yoga is right, okay? I'm sorry, not just of yoga, but of, kar not, not just of karma in yoga, but of kar the karma theory in general. So let me put this on the board. So the way this is analyzed, a, a common way this is analyzed, is that we take, um, we analyze merit. So what I was saying before is the bare bones view leaves a lot to be explained. We need to know how in the world does right action produce merit? How, what in the world is merit? What is it? This like, well, is it a note in God's ledger, or is it a psychological state? Is it a physical state? Is it some something that's following me around in the sky? What is merit? Where is it? What is it? And then, um, what? How does merit produce these consequences? And the same kinds of questions are 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 needing in need of answer here. We all know what right and wrong actions are. What right and wrong actions are generally is just kind of what you ought to do. And what the right action is in, in certain Hindu contexts might be different from what the right action is for you to do. But the basic idea is um, right an analysis of right action is the action you're supposed to do, the best action or something like that. That's not very detailed, but we need a kind of all-purpose definition. That, we don't need to put a question mark over right action because that's not that confusing. That's not that mysterious. And I don't think we need to put question marks over good, good and bad consequences because that's not that mysterious either. Good consequences are going to include pleasure. Bad consequences are going to include pain. In the context of yoga, at least, and many other traditions, good consequences are going to be things like um, good births. So being born into a body where you're a, a, a human being, for one thing, under, in privileged circumstances in a higher varna, for example. Bad consequences are going to be to be born as an animal, be born as a plant, be born as um, a, a human being in a very low class and poor station, perhaps with, with um, disability issues or you know, a disability of some kind, physical or otherwise. And then long life and short life. Long life is thought to be a good consequence. Short life is thought to be a bad consequence. Okay, so the way Potter analyzes this, he says, yeah, we need to, we need to answer these questions, okay? So this is how he, what he thinks. Merit, he analyzes merit in terms of habits. I'm sorry, habits is there, but it, I'm going to write good habits. So right act, for, for him, we start with right action. That's not especially problematic. Right action produces good habits. So... Um, you, um, let's see, what do you do? Well, it's a good habit to brush your teeth, to floss and brush your teeth every night, okay? So you, first night, it's like, oh, I hate flossing my teeth, and then you're like bleeding and stuff, but the dentist said you better start fl flossing your teeth or you're gonna have some real problems later. So you floss your teeth every night, then you brush, and trust me, after about three weeks of that, it's gonna become second nature. You might not like it, but it won't be that difficult, okay? Good habit. Now we've got a, if, if merit is just a good habit, then, well, good habits aren't mysterious. We, we not only, we understand good habits. Good habits just mean something like a disposition to perform right actions. And it makes, per, so now what, what this, this analysis does is it basically answers this question, what is merit? It's good habits. What are good habits? You don't know what habits are? You know what habits are. Come on, we don't need to explain that. So you, you answer this question, and you answer this question, because it's pretty clear that right actions produce good habits. OK? Likewise, on the bottom, wrong action produces bad habits. Smoking. I've been playing internet chess. I, I'm not good at chess, but it's just like, it's, it really is this kind of terrible habit. 
because it's timed and it's kind of it's nerdy, but it just it gives you this kind of rush of adrenaline when you play and like oh I, ugh, I won, yes. I'll just play one more quick game. Okay, bad habits. I'm not sure that's a bad habit. It is. I can. I, it feels like a bad habit. And then okay. So we answer the question, what is demerit? And the question, how does wrong action produce demerit? By analyzing demerit in terms of bad habits. There are Sanskrit terms here that aren't really that important. But the habits here are, in Sanskrit, are samskaras. If you just use the word habit, you're fine. And what I want to say is um, Potter, Potter's one of the first people that analyzes some scars as habits. And then every, it just spreads like wildfire. Everyone thinks that the, the proper translation of some scar is something like habit. Patterns of behavior, dispositions, something like that. Tendencies. Everyone follows his lead. And then it isn't hard to see how good habits produce good consequences for the agent. and how bad habits produce bad consequences for the agent. Bad habit not to brush your teeth every night. Consequence, cavities, root canal, whatever. Good habit to brush your teeth, good consequences, clean bill of health, lower dental bills, better breath. OK? So this is kind of uh, slightly more, not to diminish, uh, Milos, not to diminish your comments, but I just want to say this, is, this has, is in the same spirit of what you said, but it's just slightly more sophisticated. It should be, because this guy gets, you know, this guy publishes books on the topic. It should be a little more sophisticated than your view and my view of what karma might mean. But this is going to be a, what he thinks is a very commonsensical view. And like I said at the end of class last time, does anyone deny any of this? Does anyone not believe that right actions produce good habits? Does anyone believe that when you have good habits, you tend to get good consequences as a result? Does anyone deny my theory of dental hygiene, according to which flossing makes it easier to floss and avoids cavities, and not flossing makes it harder to floss and produces cavities, or something like that? So this is the supposed to be a very commonsensical view. Right, any comments or questions about this? This is where we were last time. It took the same amount of time to go over it again. I just went over it again, because I want to make sure it's clear. Yes? Okay, so you were reading a, you said you're reading a book about Buddhism and it was talking about karma and it said there's this idea that you have to lock in good karma. If you don't lock in good karma, it won't stick around as long or something like that. Yeah. Or, or if you do something wrong, you'll lose the good karma if it isn't locked in. That sounds to me like a Western interpretation. It's not something I'm familiar with. I don't mean to be talking necessarily about Buddhism here, but, I, but my sense of, of the Buddhist, um, the, uh, the careful analyses in the Buddhist, original Buddhist traditions, they have this notion of a samskara, other things related to samskaras that are supposed to perform the function that a samskara does. And so it, I think it would be very simple for Potter and all of his followers to, to put this, to interpret the Buddhist theories of karma the same, in a similar way. In Hinduism, is there any role for meditation and prayer in, in karma? Um, in, in certain traditions, there are. In certain traditions, it's well, in the yoga traditions, it's thought that um, different kinds of concentration can eliminate um, merit and demerit. So maybe it's not a large, a big leap from that to this locking in notion, right? Yeah. I don't want to erase the distinctions between Hinduism and Buddhism here, and yet, I, but I think it's safe to say they're quite similar. In the carefully worked out accounts in the Buddhist traditions, it's very much very similar to this. 
not very similar to, to Potter, but similar to what I have here. And, the, uh, and this notion of some scars somehow being, some scars are doing something in there, but we don't know exactly what they're doing. That's common in Buddhism too. Okay. Okay. So this is the part of this material that I think gets a little tricky and sketchy. Um, there are a lot of, I made a list of five different potential problems with this account. But I think for the sake of time and for the sake of bridging what we're doing today, right now, with what we'll be doing next class, I want to just focus on two problems. Um, OK? So two problems. Two problems. I'm going to call Potter's account two problems with the contemporary interpretation. Two problems with the contemporary interpretation. And we're going to see, I'll give you textual evidence for this. If you've read the Bhagavad Gita chapter that I gave you, chapters that I gave you, you'll see this problem already. The first problem is um, we need some kind of role for desire. Desire No, OK. Um, you asked, is this a problem with the book, the Bhagavad Gita? No. Um, what I want to say is there are two problems with this contemporary account that I have blocked off here. So the Potter account, the, the analysis of merit in terms of habit, that's the view that I explained um, before. And then what I want to say is there are at least two problems with this account. And. Um, I mentioned the Bhagavad Gita because it's, cl it's clear from the, just what we read in the Bhagavad Gita that um, desire plays some critical, critical role in the production of merit and demerit. And when Krishna uh, prescribes to Arjuna and the rest of us to act without desire, to be desireless, he explains that when we're desireless, we don't accrue merit and demerit. And since merit and demerit are ultimately counterproductive to the attainment of moksha, liberation. We want to get rid of all of our merit and demerit. Yes, we even want to get rid of our merit, which, if left alone, would deliver us pleasure and long life and beautiful bodies and things like that in the future. We even don't want that because it will only wrap us up more tightly in the rebirth process and keep us ignorant of what's really good for us. We want to get rid of merit and demerit. And Krishna's basic message is, well, if you want to get rid of merit and demerit, you got to get rid of desire. You don't want to get rid of action altogether. The old view, the view that we see in the old, um, in the uh, renunciate literature that we read for the second class in this semester, that old view is, hey, look, right action produces merit. Wrong action produces demerit. Whenever you act, you're acting rightly or wrongly. So you're kind of in a, in a double bind here. So the only way to get rid of merit and demerit is to stop acting altogether. Krishna refutes that view. He says, you can't stop acting altogether. You're inevitably acting. You have to go on acting. And yet you can perform actions without producing merit and demerit if there's no desire. We have to explain what in the world does it mean, no desire. And we'll talk about that more so next class. But all I want to point out now is it's clear from the Bhagavad Gita and many other texts that there's a role in the Yoga Sutra and others. There's an essential role for desire. If there's desire, you're going to get merit, merit and demerit. And if there's no desire, then you're not going to get merit and demerit. OK, so the trick, the trick to, a, to, to not accruing merit and demerit is to not have desire. The desire is not even on this diagram. What in the world is going on here? What does Potter say? How does Potter's view consistent with this claim that desire is a necessary condition and sufficient condition of the production of merit and demerit? OK, the other problem here that I think can be appreciated independent of the Bhagavad Gita is um, that there's no way putting this point aside, there's no way to avoid um, merit and demerit. 
OK, so put, I guess I should have given you this one first and then this one. There's no way, forget what I said about desire. There's no way to, on this account, there's no way to avoid it. If you act, it's going to either be right or wrong, and you're going to get either good or bad. Um, you're going to get either merit or demerit, good or bad habits. And you don't want those. And so what do you do? You can't, how do I act and not accrue merit and demerit? There's no, that diagram makes it look like that's impossible. This diagram just says act, get merit or demerit. But there's got to be a way to act without getting merit or demerit. Okay? So there's no, if this is the full account, then there's no way to avoid merit and demerit. Additionally, this account explains no role for desire. Now, fortunately, the, both of these problems are solved in the same way. Desire has to have a role. Not only do we have to, we, we need a role for desire. Problem number one says that. But once we specify the role for desire, it's going to give us a way to avoid merit and demerit. OK? So these are two problems, and this is the solution. The solution is clarify the role that desire has. Then you've got a role for desire, just like the Bhagavad Gita describes. And the, the presence or absence of desire is the way to avoid merit and demerit. Now, um, OK, questions about that? We've got we've to we've add some stuff to this diagram. We've got to get desire in there somewhere. That's where I'm going next. If you have a suggestion about where desire might go, or just questions, ask those now, please. Yes? Oh, that's, that's very good, yes. So can, can the desire be a desire for consequences, right? So. So um, to use your example, Milos, so I'm helping my neighbor, and I'm thinking, man, that guy's got an awesome snowblower. And if I can just help him a few more, this is actually, I have a neighbor who, who snowblows my sidewalk when it's like two feet deep. And, and I, then I shovel his walk. I'm not doing that. He started first, so I'm not doing it to get him to do it. But OK, so, the, so one possibility is, so how would I represent, so that one possibility is that you have these desires for consequences, right? If you read the Bhagavad Gita carefully, you must have. Um, this seems to be part of the idea, that you have desires for consequences. Can I, was it your comment? OK, can I come back to that for a second? Um, in a second? Um, sorry, this is, I don't, I'm kind of, you wouldn't know it by looking at this board, but I'm kind of anal about neatness. This is really bothering me. Um, OK. Before we get to that possibility, let me just, and I, that's the kind of possibility I think works best. Let me just say this. Um, I think the most, na so this idea of desireless action, you're supposed to perform actions without desire. I think a natural way to interpret that is this, that if you perform, actually, maybe we can do it. Maybe we can do it this way and dissolve for momentarily dissolve the distinction between good and bad here and just put it this way. Um, you perform an action. It's supposed to produce ha a habit. Right? And then the habit is going to produce consequences, personal consequences. OK, so one thought is, if desire has to have some role in here, I think this is a natural way to, most of the literature on this assumes that the desire we're talking about here is the desire that motivates the action. The desire that motivates the action. So when your action is motivated by desire, then it produces a habit. Um, that all gets really confusing because, for one thing, it's not clear that you can act without desire. Um, and even if you can act without, so, so I 
shovel my neighbor's walk with the desire that he will later reciprocate when it snows really hard and the, the snow blows all up against my fence and, I, and he'll snow blow the two feet of snow and save me like eight hours of work in, ten, in about 15 minutes. That's my desire. I desire to have my walk cleaned. I perform the action hoping that will happen. By performing the action, I produce the habit. And then the habit has these personal consequences. Um, now, the action is the right one here. I, I shovel his walk. So you may say, well, the, the motive isn't very noble. But it, that, let's put that aside. It's not clear that, the, that the, the desire is clarifying very much here. It seems like either A, our actions are always motivated by desire, and there's no way to avoid this, or B, our actions are not always motivated by desire, but it doesn't matter what our actions are motivated by. When we do stuff, we for it forms habits. So, so what I want to say is, if you put desire here, it's not clear how it's helping to explain the formation of habits. We can explain habits just in terms of actions. And it's not clear why, it's not clear why a desire here is, is essential to the habit. And if I'm motivated by something other than desire, it doesn't produce the habit. I mean, so you may not know what it would possibly mean to be motivated by something other than a desire. But suppose the, 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 the thing that motivates me, you may think this is implausible. Let's say the thing that motivates me is the commandment that says, thou shalt, sorry, I'm, this is going to reveal some real ignorance here. Thou shalt um, honor thy neighbor or whatever. I don't think there's a commandment that actually says that, but something like that. Okay? The Bible says I should shovel my neighbor's walk. That fact is why I do it. You say, oh, do you want him to help you later? No, I don't care. The Bible says it. You don't want to go to hell, do you? No, I don't care. I don't really believe in hell, but the Bible says, okay, that's my rationale. So suppose if that's the rationale, then I'm not motivated by a desire. I'm motivated by some, some noble, some, some religious belief, okay? It still seems like I'm going to form a habit. So I don't know if I'm, I don't feel like I'm saying this very clearly, but I, what I want to say is desire doesn't, doesn't help explain much here. It seems like I'm going to have a habit as a consequence of my action, whether I'm motivated by a desire or not. Yeah. So wouldn't the habit become, I'm going to perform acts of kindness when there's something in it for me? Which is affected by the desire. Right, so is the habit, are you asking, is the habit not just going to be a habit to do something, but a habit to do something when the desire, particular desire is satisfied? Right. It could be. It could be. Um, would that be a problem, though? Yeah, you might, you might get in the habit of only helping when you're going to be helped later and selfishly, be selfishly motivated. You only get into the habit of helping others when it's going to lead to getting helped yourself later. And that may be a problem because it's immoral or something like that. OK, yeah, that, I think that makes sense. I'm concerned about the formation of the habit. Um, it, it, let me say it this way. If desire, if this is right, and we only get merit and demerit when we have desire. And we don't get merit and demerit when we don't have desire. And merit and demerit are just habits. Habits. Good and bad habits. How is it that when, how is it the desire produces habits? I think that's my question. And you can say, well, your habit, the specific habit you form will depend on the desire that motivated it because you won't just have a habit of shoveling the walk. You'll have a habit of shoveling the walk when you expect returns or something like that. I think that's right. I think you, you may, your habit, the details of your habit might depend on the desire. But what I want to know is how could it be that habits will not form at all, assuming merit and demerit are habits? How, is, how can it be that habits just will not form at all if you aren't motivated by desire? Um, now let me get to your suggestion, okay? Okay. So here's um, the way. I'm not the first person to think this, but uh, um, not too many people do. 
there's this idea in the Bhagavad Gita and what you read in, for, in chapter 2 that says something like we shouldn't desire the, the outcomes or the fruit, the results of our actions. So what about this? Now, the personal consequences are going to be, um, often be distant. Okay, so these personal consequences we've, we've been, consequences we've been talking about are going to be kind of distant. Um, let's say this happens. When I perform an action, um, it has these kind of immediate consequences. Immediate consequences. I know this might be confusing to draw a distinction between immediate consequences and possibly distant future consequences, but it's, it's important, I think. Immediate consequences. So I um, shovel my neighbor's walk, and I finish, and I'm like, ah, I feel really, I feel like a good citizen. I like it that I'm a good citizen. So the immediate consequence for me is, the immediate consequence is going to be either pleasure or pain. And let's suppose in this case it's pleasure. That feels good. Feels good to be a good neighbor. Feels good to get some exercise, whatever it is. Okay. So I feel pleasure. There are these immediate consequences in the form of pleasure and pain. Okay, so what I want to say here is, actually, let me do this with an equal sign. The immediate consequences are just pleasure or pain. It's not that this produces this. It's that, that these are the same. Okay, so I do something, and it causes pleasure or pain for me. If it causes pleasure, I desire it. And if it causes pain, I become averse to it. I don't want I desire to avoid it. And it's these desires or aversions that produce the habit. So um, he, here, again, here, use this example. I go out, I shovel the walk. It's physically invigorating. I'm sweating, but it, like I warm, I'm all toasty, and it feels good, and then I can feel good about myself, and oh, what do you know, my, my other neighbor drove by while I was shoveling that neighbor's walk. Well, won't they think highly of me? All of this stuff gives me a lot of pleasure, I think. Well, people are going to think well of me, and I'm going to get a pat on the back, and all this stuff. It's pleasure. I, I immediately, the immediate consequence is pleasure. As a consequence of the pleasure, I want, I want pleasure, and I thereby want, to do, want that pleasure again in the future. I'm going to, I'm going to um, shovel his walk next time. And then, with the intention or realization or something like that that I'm going to shovel his walk next time, that's when, that's when the habit occurs. That's when the habit is produced. Okay? If instead I perform the action, pleasure arises as a result, but I don't desire the pleasure, then I don't desire to get the pleasure again next time, and I don't desire to shovel his walk. And so I don't produce the habit of shoveling his walk. Now you may say, well, that's too bad. You should produce, you should have the habit of shoveling his walk because it's, it's virtuous or something. Put that aside. Think about habits as something that robs us of our freedom something that prevents us from, act, from being fully free. You don't want habits on this view. If you don't want habits, then you don't want to be disposed toward performing certain actions. And the idea here is the thing that gets us habits, the thing that makes us disposed toward produce, to performing certain actions, is that we desire some consequence of performing that action. Okay. So now it's, it's actually not I mean, I'm not sure which of these I want to say. I, th I think my real view is going to be something like, when we talk about habits, we're just talking about desires. I have a desire to feel like a good citizen, feel physically exhilarated, and be admired by my other neighbors. That desire constitutes a habit in me to shovel the walk every time there's less than four inches of snow. More than that, I don't know. I think I might just shovel my own. Okay? so. So, okay, this is getting to be a complicated argument. Tell me how, can I go back to you and, and say, is, um, does this make sense to you? Because you already had it in mind that there was this desire for consequences issue. Okay, we don't want merit or demerit, so should we just not do anything? Yeah, that was how you put it. Like, 
OK, good. I think um, on this view, desire is the problem. Aversion is just a negative desire, the desire to avoid something. So don't be confused. Desire and aversion are just two, two sides of the same coin. Um, the, the idea here would be something like this. Um, well, it, it turns out that pleasure is something to be avoided as well, because pleasure tends to produce desire. But I think it's at least theoretically possible that you could be pleased by something and not desire it, uh, to desire it in the future, right? Something is pleasing to you, but you feel guilty about it. And this isn't a religious context. You just say, that was pleasing, but I shouldn't do that. And so you don't desire to do it in the future or something like that. Or um, I, give, I have a whole list of these examples in a paper I wrote where I say, like, um, I might be, I'm walking up the steps and I fall in like this comical kind of head over heels, like, and I'm, and all of you are just, you can't help it. You're just like a little pleased by it. You take pleasure in it, but you don't want it to happen again, right? Or people tell these kind of off color jokes, right? And you kind of grin and you say, oh, that's awful. You don't desire that this person go and tell someone else. You don't repeat the joke. But you know what I mean? So there, it's possible to be pleased and not desire, come to desire something, I think. Um, so the, the idea is for at least part of the idea is something like pleasure and pain by themselves aren't necessarily the problem. You want to avoid forming desires and aversions. So you experience the pleasure or pain. I mean, really, if it's, if it's pleasure or pain is not entirely avoidable. Um, physical pain and stuff like that is unavoidable. So you, you experience it, but you don't, you don't desire to reproduce pleasures. You don't desire to avoid pains. And then if you don't desire the pleasure and the avoidance of pain, then you don't form habits to act in certain ways under certain circumstances. So most of our habits are the consequence of wanting pleasure and wanting to avoid pain. And if we become kind of impartial of those things, we won't form the habits. And if habits, if merit and demerit are just habits, then we won't form merit and demerit. And voila, we've got we've gotten rid of the main obstacle to the attainment of liberation. Yes? Switch which ones? Good, okay, so... Um, the, the re you're asking about the relationship between pleasure and desire, and in the, in the case of the renunciates that we read about in the beginning of the semester, two weeks ago, um, are they going to avoid desire in order to avoid pleasure? Oh, do they desire pain, and, and are they averse to pleasure? Sometimes. It seems like sometimes they are because they, they do, they're supposed to avoid pleasure like the plague, avoid praise from people, get out of your homeland so nobody remembers you and, and exhibits kindness toward you as a consequence of knowing you. And yet they're supposed to kind of invite, I don't know how carefully you read these, but you, you're kind of supposed to invite disgrace upon you, right? Um, yeah, how to fit that into the full scheme of getting rid of pleasure and getting rid of desire and aversion is tricky, I think. Um, but I think that those are all practices that are aimed at um, avoiding pleasure so that you don't have desire. Now, they do bring about pain. And, and there's a question about whether the renunciate becomes averse to these things or not. But the renunciate is always characterized as impartial. I'd even use the word indifferent, but it, that makes it sound kind of cold. It's just kind of like uh, impartial. And so hopefully, the renunciate is not becoming desirous or averse to things as a consequence of their pleasurefulness or painfulness. Um, I'm wondering if, I'm just wondering if it's not worth um, redrawing this. I'll get to other questions in a second. So you perform an action. Um, I'm going to kind of go in a roundabout way because I'm worried about space here. So you perform an action, and you have these, um, you have pleasure, pleasure or pain arises as a consequence. pleasure or pain. Um, the action is I shovel my neighbor's walk. The consequence, the immediate consequence, immediate consequence is pleasure or pain. Let's say it's pleasure in this case. Ah, I'm such a good guy. Okay, I'm pleased by that. 
Um, OK, so I'm pleased by that. The next thing that happens is desire. The desire to feel the same pleasure again. Or if it's pain, it's a desire to avoid the same pain again. And the desire to feel the same pleasure again constitutes a habit to repeat the action. And if habits are merit and demerit, then that's your analysis of merit and demerit. And now we've got desire in here. The, remember, the problem was, wait a minute, there's no role for desire. Here's the role for desire. The second problem was, how do I perform actions without getting merit and demerit? The answer is, perform actions. They'll produce pleasure and pain, but don't want the pleasure or pain. Don't want, don't desire or be averse to the pleasure or pain. Then you won't form the habits. Um, so really, it's going to be something like this. The, the person that's doing this right is going to um, do something, experience perhaps pleasure. But then they're just going to say, but I don't want pleasure. They're a renunciate. I don't want pleasure. And because I don't want pleasure, the pleasure and the desire that arises as a result is not compelling me, propelling me to re repeat that action in the future. And I don't have a habit. And all my habits are like that. I kind of deprogram all of my habits in the same way. Because really what we're doing is we're, we're pursuing pleasure and we're trying to avoid pain and other stuff that's good and bad for us. And we're the, 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 um, the carrot and the stick are conditioning us to repeat these same behaviors over and over again. Some of the behaviors, some of the habits produce success. Some of them produce failure. But they're all habits in the end. And habits are really not a very good thing if the goal is something like perfect spontaneity and freedom or something like that. Um, OK? OK, questions about this? Yes, thank you. Let me just repeat, let me repeat the first part. So you're trying to get your head around how a renunciate would experience pleasure or pain. Respond. Respond. Good. Yes. OK, how does, this, how does the renunciate experience a painful sensation like t putting his hand in the fire and not um, form an aversion to it? And if he doesn't form an aversion to it, then how is he not doing it later? Or is that the concern? I mean, yeah, these aversions keep us, on, keep us safe. Yes, OK. Um, OK. Because the pleasure makes sense, right? But it's the aversion part that's like, how do you experience pain over and over again? Well, I, the, the, the renunciate is supposed to be able to know not to put his hand in the fire and to pull his hand out of the fire if he accidentally puts it in there. Um, despite the renunciates aren't supposed to get too close to fire anyway, most of them because it's a source of warmth and pleasure and stuff like that. But, so the, the, they stub their toe. OK, they stub their toe. Um, so they, they feel pain. And then most of us would form a habit to a, avoid, like if suppose we're stubbing our toe in the same spot in the, in the, in the house. And then we just say, well, I, I've done this where I, I kind of remodeled this part of the house. And then I was stubbing my toe on the, on the um, trim that I had put down on the floor. And then I eventually formed the habit to just take that corner a lot wider than I had been, haven't stubbed my toe in many months. So that sounds very functional and good. Um, and the question is, well, the two questions are, how does the renunciate avoid stubbing his toe if he doesn't form a habit? And one possibility is just that the, the renunciate is just much more, is able to cultivate an awareness of his environment that is much more refined than yours and mine is. So that the renunciate can note 
the danger of stubbing his toe there without just automatically taking the corner wide every time. He does take the corner wide every time, but it's not an automatic process. Now, it's hard to say why that's better than what I do, why his lack of habit is better than my habit, even though we both manage to avoid our, our stubbing our toes. But think about, there are all these situations where we'll, the circumstances change. So I gave the example last class of I move my garbage can from one corner to the other in my office, and for th three months, I'm throwing, the gar throwing balls of paper into the wrong corner, and they're landing on the floor or something like that. Or I'm pulling the wrong drawer open in the kitchen. That's where the knife used to be. Now, where the heck's the knife? You know, oh, I, I forgot where I put it or whatever. So there's this, the idea is that habits can be counterproductive as well. And one, the way that one author, his name's Roy Parrott, the way he describes this is he says, he uses the analogy of a martial arts student. And he says, so the martial arts student goes in there first few months or whatever and just gets, you know, outmatched by everyone he's, he's up against. And then the teacher kind of trains him in these habits, these particular habitual responses. You know, if you've ever seen Karate Kid, that's very unrealistic. But that's the idea. The original Karate Kid, where he's just kind of repeat, re repeating these same physical motions all the time, and then he can, he can respond to attacks with these habitual patterns, right? But then Parrot says, yeah, but ultimately, that when, the, when the student who has advanced a good deal and can defeat a lot of the other students faces the master, the master knows how all of his habits and can use the habits against him. He knows that the student is going to respond in a certain way, move in a certain direction when he makes a motion, and, and then he can do that and defeat the student very easily as a consequence of knowing his habits. And so that the ideal for the master is to actually transcend the habits and get to the point where he is not operating out of habit, he's operating in some kind of spontaneous response to the environment that is, first of all, more f free and more authentic, um, but also more, more successful. Um, so all I, think, all I think we have to appreciate is, okay, it might be a little bit mysterious how the renunciate operates in the world without habits, and yet, um, we can all acknowledge that the habits go haywire at some point when the environment changes. And if the, the advantage of not having habits is that you can respond to novel circumstances in a more appropriate way, and that you just don't have this baggage of habits controlling your behavior all the time, um, then that, that, might, that might outweigh the costs. But I, I think you're right, There's, there are further puzzles here about like, wait a minute, good habits are all right. This is the way one person has dealt with it, to, to use this master, student master analogy. So the goal is to, the goal at first might be to, to get all the good habits and get rid of the bad ones. The long-term goal is going to be to transcend your habits altogether. So you're not operating in some kind of rote, mechanical fashion. Any other questions? Yes, we've got a minute and a half, and I'll try to answer this last question. Don't pack up. Go ahead. Well, the merit and demerit is going to arise as long as the desire is produced. So when this is gone, the habit, when the desire is gone, then the habit's gone. And if the habit's gone, then the merit and demerit's gone. So this allows us to continue to live in the world without accruing merit and demerit and still be able to act. And that's what Krishna is advocating. OK, good. Thanks a lot. See you Wednesday. Sure. Yes. Because he wants uh, moksha, which is liberation. Well, Krishna is this kind of god figure, so he doesn't really have to himself worry about this, but okay. he's, adv he's advising Arjuna okay. to avoid merit and demerit okay. so by avoiding desire. So do we need to know like, the, the fact that he's a 